Now we're going to be speaking about the, the mother of all limbs, which is the sifat al-qalb, the heart, the qualities of the heart. And the Prophet وسلم, said, as is mentioned on page 110 in English, 111 in Arabic, uh, صلحت, صلحة, said that the a, a heart is the morsel of the body. It's a piece of flesh in the body. When that comes right, then the rest of the body comes right. And when that um, gets corrupted, then the rest of the body also gets corrupted. So engage in rectifying it so that you may rectify all your limbs and faculties. So if we want to bring change, if we want to bring a difference in our uh, the actions that are coming out of our limbs, we have to focus on the driver's seat. The driver's seat is the heart. So when the car is making all these weird moves, uh, you're not going to be looking at the tires, not going to look at the car, you look at the, who's the one who's driving, who's behind the wheel that's making all of this. So similarly, the limbs are, are going to do what the captain says. That is the um, heart. So that's what we have to focus on, the aspects of the heart. So we're on page 113, uh, inshallah. Al-qawlu fi qalb. fi qalb Know that the blameworthy qualities of the heart are many. And the path to purify the heart from these vices is very long. It's lengthy. And the way to heal them in, is difficult to comprehend. If it requires a lot of... It, um, um, if it requires to have the best of specialists to figure out how to treat the body, imagine when it comes to the spiritual heart, how it requires to have experts who are focused on this aspect and the disease of the heart and the rectification of it. It's not easy. And the knowledge and the practice of the heart's treatment has completely disappeared. He's saying this a thousand years ago. Thousand years ago, he says, the knowledge and practice of the heart's treatment has completely disappeared because of people's neglect of their own souls. People are just not worried about their own souls, not worried about the rectification. And they are busy in the distractions of the adornments of this world, busy in, 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 in amassing the material things of this world. And the distraction of this world, which is all the wealth and, and the fame and the name and pomp and so forth, that they are not focused on the rectification of the self, because of which people, this has become like a lost science. And majority of this, in detail, Imam Ghazali has mentioned in the book Revival of the Religious Sciences, Ikhya ul Ulum al Din. And he has mentioned it on a section called Rub al Muhrikat and Warub al Munjiyat, the ways to perdition and the ways to salvation. So there's, he's divided them up into four quarters. One quarter is how you destroy yourself, and one quarter is how you get yourself back up and get salvation. Okay, so um, that's what he says over here. I am going to warn you, and I'm going to uh, uh, you know, tell you about three of the main, he says, disease of the heart. And so that you can be careful about it. And these are what he says, Ummahat. These are the mother of all destructive diseases. Everything else comes as a result of this. These are the main three ones. What are they? Number one, hasad, jealousy. Number two, riya, ostentation and show. And number three, ujub, self-conceit. To be conceited, to think of ourselves as superior to others. Strive your utmost, he says, Strive your utmost to purify your heart of these vices. If you conquer these, then the rest of it, if you learn how to take care of these three, you can learn the rest of them from the book I just referred to, Imam Ghazali's more detailed book. He says, you can go check it over there. This is for starters. 
But if you are unable to deal with these three evil dispositions, then you will probably definitely be less capable. You will be less capable of treating the other ones. Less capable of treating the other ones. So the main thing is that whatever is mentioned here, you have to start with that. And uh, take, as they say, take baby steps. And if you do well, inshallah, you'll be able to do better when you, for the other ones. Otherwise, he says, you're wasting your time. You need to figure it out. It's not the issue is not about knowledge. It's not about knowledge. Instead, the issue is about wanting to practice on it. وَلَا تَظُنُّنَّ أَنَّهُ تَسْلُمُ لَكَ نِيَةٌ صَالِحَةٌ فِي تَعَلُّمِ الْعِلْمِ وَفِي قَلْبِكَ شَيْءٌ مِنْ الْحَسَادِ وَالْرِيَاءِ وَالْعُجُبِ He says, don't ever imagine that you will be able to maintain a sound intention. Don't ever think you'll be able to maintain a sound intention while seeking knowledge if you have a dirty heart. If you have a dirty heart. What could it be dirty for? Envy, ostentation, and conceit. If any of these three diseases are in a person's heart, he says you're wasting your time trying to seek knowledge. We will never be able to truly have ikhlas and sincerity and um, focus in our studies if we are, if our hearts are not clean, okay? So um, how, do we, how do we recognize these qualities in ourselves? Well, that's the start that we're reading this. Once we start reading this, inshallah, we'll start reflecting. It won't happen until we don't reflect upon ourselves. But in order to even reflect, we have to know what we're looking for to see what, do I have this problem within me or not? That's one thing. Second thing is the company of spiritual doctors. This company of mashayikh who are focused on spiritual diseases. That helps a lot. I, I was preparing for my baris, which is going to start right after this class, for the one that I do every night, every evening before Maghrib, through the Salam's channel. And I am reading through an amazing book, Risalat al Mustarshidin. Okay, Imam Zaid Shakir translated this as well. Uh, awesome book of Imam Muhasibi, rahimahullah. So I'm, I'm covering this book. It's on spirituality as well, a little bit different taste. So, um, I came across a story, and inshallah, this is one of these stories I'm going to be mentioning tonight there, is on muhasaba and just being honest with yourself and being aware and reflective of yourself and others. So there's many stories. One of the stories about Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, rahmatullah Umar Abdul Aziz, rahmatullah as we know, as he's been called the fifthly rightly guided khalifa, fifth rightly guided khalifa, because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving him so much zuhud and so much taqwa. And um, was just an amazing, outstanding person. So he had just buried his son. And you can imagine, he was very, a very beloved son of his, Abdul Malik. And he had just buried it, and he was in grief when someone came and was speaking in front of him. And what he did, he was making a shadow with his left hand. He was talking with his left hand like this. So Imam Ghazali, I mean, sorry, one of the Aziz, called out to him, corrected him. And he said that, um, do not point with your left hand, point with your right hand. So the man said, I've never had a day like this. This is shocking. A person buries the most beloved person to him, his own son right now. And then he's worried about what you hand I use, right or left. And so he thanked Omar of the Aziz and he said, Jazakallahu an Islam khayra. May Allah reward you on behalf of Islam in the most beautiful manner. May you be recognized and awarded on behalf of Islam for being so caring. He says, لا بل جزا, بل جزا الإسلام عني خيرا. Rather, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward Islam on my behalf in the best possible manner. Meaning these etiquettes and these uh, beautiful qualities that I'm sharing with you, I've learned it from Islam. If it wasn't for Islam, I would have never known this. Okay? Islam taught me this. So I am, I am indebted to Islam, not the other way around. Why did I share that story? It's an example of a person being aware. Imagine how self-aware Imam Abdul Aziz was with himself. There's many stories of that too. And he's aware of his surroundings. And he's aware of his surroundings to see who's awake uh, and who is leading a life of ghafla, who is in heedlessness. So this is what 
is required from us if we want to recognize whether this is within us is number one be aware of ourselves and second thing try to be in the company of people who are focused on this, physicians and doctors so yeah spiritual doctors one day when i was coming back from uh, india i asked i went to go spend 10 days with a spiritual uh, a spiritual a, doc, a doctor or a sheikh in Tazkia. His name was Qari Amir al Hassan Rahimahumullah. He passed away some many years ago now, almost 10 years ago. So, on the way back after 10 days spending in India with him, he told me, he was very elderly, he was 90 years old. He said, Why are you coming? Why are you coming? You got the wrong number. Like, that's what he's trying to say. Don't come here. I don't have anything. He told me, I don't have anything. What are you coming for me? I said, Sheikh, I said, just come. I need you. And he says, No, I am nobody. So in my heart, I wanted to tell him that that's why I'm coming to you. I'm looking for someone who regards himself as nothing. What they call uh, technically fanaiya. Someone who's reached a level where they have completely destroyed their nafs and have put themselves on ground zero. In the, in the eyes of Allah, they're on ground 100 or 100 level, you know. But in the terms of the dunya, they have completely put themselves down and who think of themselves as nobody. Those are the people I need to stay in the company. I said, I'm going there. Because coming from my environment, coming from my background in this country, we find ourselves that many times we have a lot of huge egos and um, self-conceit, pride, arrogance, all these type of things. And how do you get rid of that? By staying in the company of people who actually can call you out for your mistakes. And you can look at them and emulate what they have. So Alhamdulillah, it was a very beneficial 10 days. On my way back, when I was stopped at O'Hare Airport here in Chicago, they asked, where are you coming from? I said, I'm coming from my doctor. What doctor? I said, I'm coming from my, I'm coming from my heart doctor. I said, what, you leave Chicago to go see a heart doctor in India? What kind of heart doctor? I said, yes. There's a heart, qalb, qalb, a spiritual heart that requires a doctor that needs to tune it, that needs to take a look at it, that needs to do a, a, you know, a study of it, just like we have studies of the physical heart. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to spend time and read the books of such righteous, pious people who um, guide us when we need it most. Okay? The first one is hasad, envy. Envy is the greatest form of miserliness. Um, he says that a jealous person, what is he? Let's compare him to someone who is stingy. Someone who is a miser and stingy is the one who is stingy towards others with his possessions. I own something, I don't want to give it to you. I'm being stingy with whatever I have. But the greater miserliness is the one who is stingy with Allah's favors upon his servants. Favors that are not even his, but are of the vast treasures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's omnipotent power. Okay. So what we're saying here is when a person is jealous and he says, why does so-and-so have these looks? Why does so-and-so have these, you know, these amazing genes? Why do they have this amazing IQ? Why are they doing so well in school? Why am I, and we're comparing ourselves to in those things that we don't have with others. In reality, we're upset as why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give something to someone and didn't give it to me? So this is a great, a direct objection and a criticism of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says jealousy is coming from greed and this is a heightened form of greed and miserliness. The envious person is the one who is praised when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from his treasures of omnipotent power bestows one of his servants wealth or knowledge or love in the hearts of the people. Or any other good fortune to the point where he begins to wish that Allah's favor would be taken away from that person even if the same favor would not be transferred to him as a result. So the goal, the idea is you just don't want to see someone having what, you know, something good. You're not even worried about whether you get it or not. You just simply do not want someone else to have it. That's where the problem lies. You just don't want someone else to have it. It's called tamanni zawali ni'matil ghayr. To desire 
that someone else's blessings be taken away from them, even if you don't get it. So this is a direct objection on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. والحسود والذي يشق عليه نعم الله سبحانه وتعالى. He says this person is jealous. Why does Allah سبحانه وتعالى like make people like him? Why is he able to get some other favor, get attract the hearts of the people, get a lot of love from people? How come I don't have that? So he's upset about these things. فهذا منتهى الخبز. He says this is really the pinnacle of wickedness that you don't worry about whether you get it or not. You're just simply worried about whether other people are getting it or not. And that's what the Prophet said, Al-Hasadu Ya'kul Hasanati Kama Takul Nar Hatab. The jealousy eats away from the sins the way the fire eats away from the firewood. Just like fire eats the firewood, similarly, jealousy eats through the good deeds. Okay. Wal Hasudu al Mu'adabu Ladi La Yurham. The jealous person is the one who is being punished. Such a punishment that will not come to an end. Wala yazalu fi adabin da imin. And he remains in a constant punishment. فإن الدنيا لا تخلو قط عن خلق كثير من أقرانه ومعارفه ممن أنعم الله عليهم بعلم أو مال أو جاه. Because the dunya will always have people your age. The dunya will always have people your in your age group, in your socioeconomic status apparently, in your um, you know friend circle. There's always going to be people who will have more knowledge than you, more wealth than you, as well as who will have more fame than you. So are you always going to be depressed? Are you always going to be upset that when you look at people around you that they have you? That's what he's saying. This person will remain in a continuous punishment till death will come to him. And Allah says, indeed, the punishment of the hereafter is even more severe. All right? He continues regarding jealousy. You cannot even be a true Muslim until you do not love for your Muslim brother what you love for yourself. Is mandatory, necessary that you like for others what you like for yourself. So, which is a complete opposite of jealousy. And rather, you should participate in assisting them in times of ease and in times of difficulty. And the believers are like one big wall that helps one another out, like a piece, of, like a body. That when one portion of the body is in pain, the rest of the body begins to cry out in pain. So, this is the first thing, my dear listeners, we have to clear ourselves up from is. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, grant us the ability to do so, to clean our heart from this from jealousy, from the vice of jealousy, and always be wishing good for others. And ostentation, this is the hidden form of ascribing partners to Allah. Um, and this is the one of the two types of shirk. So as I'm I'm moving on to um Riya. Is there any specific any specific questions that anyone have regarding jealousy? Um, okay, so yes. What are the, some of the things we can do to not feel jealous or envious? Very uh, good question, right? So, um, number one thing is that look at the person who we have, we're, we're feeling jealous towards. Let's say I'm very competitive in my grades and my cousin is taking the same class with me and uh, they're doing better than me. This may end up leading to jealousy. So what should you do in this type of situation? This is from Shaytan, we have to recognize that. That you're working hard, they're working hard. Intelligence comes from Allah. Ability to manage your time comes from Allah. Understanding the subject quickly comes from Allah. All of these are gifts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So when I am feeling jealous, in reality, I am angry at Allah. The Ya Allah, why did you give him that? And he didn't give that to me. So let's ask ourselves, do I want to do that? Do I have a right to be angry at Allah? How come he gave someone something that I don't have? That's pretty bad, isn't it? So that's the one way to help yourself. Second thing is, you're gonna give you're gonna give a beating to your nafs and to the shaitan. And what is that? Is that you are going to look at that person and you're going to make up a dua and you're gonna say, Ya Allah, please allow my cousin to get a much better grade. Not to say much better grade than me, you don't have to say that. Ya Allah, please allow 
my my cousin to do excellent a lot to grow in deen and dunya and all sorts of things um and so what's going to happen your nafs is going to hate this your nafs is not going to like this at all so the nafs nafs will will, will cringe but you're not going to stop you're going to keep on making dua for the same quality that you are jealous of may allah increase them in their beauty may allah increase them in their wealth may allah increase them in their intelligence may allah allow them to have excellent grades so this is a way to uh, hit at the nafs back Number three, praise that person. Praise that person when he's not around because the nafs don't want to do that. Someone we're jealous of and you're sitting amongst your own family, friends or whatnot, speak highly of that person. And the nafs will say, this is something you should not do. But you can't give up. You need to keep on doing it. Okay? Um, you can also, you know, even, even, even uh, you know, do some favors for them. Make ikram of them, honor them, you know, give them something to eat, drop off some iftar food at their house. Like really do things that your nafs will hate until you begin to like them. Hope that answers your question. Um, and how can you protect yourself from hasad as in other people giving you hasad? So the answer to that is um, you read your, your duas. Most importantly, قُلْ عَوْلُ الْفَلَقُ وَلْ عَوْلُ Every morning and every evening, read it three times. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would read it at night and blow on his palms and rub his body, right? So make sure you do the same thing. Read in the morning and read in the evening. And according to some, you can read it after every salah. This will protect us, inshallah, from the hasad of the people. Second is, do not flaunt what we have. Don't speak too highly of what you have. Too much about it to other people who you know may not be may not have your well your best interest at heart. Okay, learn how to keep those things a secret. Okay, um, the next one is uh, yeah ostentation. So this is a hidden form of shirk, and the, it is one of the two forms of idolatry. It is to seek a place in the hearts of people by which you may attain fame and veneration. Love of fame comes from the erroneous pursuit of one's inclinations. It is, it is this that destroys most people, for nothing destroys people except people themselves. SubhanAllah. Nothing destroys people except for people themselves. You can highlight that. It's such an important part. So he says, Hubbul Jah min al Hawal Muttaba al Muhlik. Why do people want fame? Because they end up wanting to follow their own inclinations and desires. If the majority of the people were objective and fair, He says, if you were to be honest with yourself, you would realize that most of the activities that we are involved in, in seeking not a sacred knowledge, in worship, not to mention customary activities, random stuff that we do every day. He says the main thing that's motivating us for that is مُرَآتُ to show to show to people. We do it out of regard for other people. We do it out of regard for other people. The motive renders their act of no worth. The, rend, the, the motive is not sincerity and ikhlas, it's about Trying to make people happy and trying to keep them happy. Um, and then he mentions the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He says, "Inna shahida yumaru bi yom al qiyam ila nar." The the martyr will be ordered on the day of judgment. A martyr, someone who gave his life for Islam, will be great. Will be dragged towards hellfire. And he'll be saying, Ya Rabbi, oh my Lord, I have given my life in your path. Oh Allah. Allah will say, what did you do for me? Ya Allah gave my most valuable thing, my life in your path. And Allah will tell him that you are a liar. Instead, you just wanted people to say that you are brave. And that was already said. You got your reward. That is your reward. You're not going to have anything here right now. 
Similarly, it will be said to a scholar, it will be said to a haji, it will be said to a ghazi, a scholar, a haji, someone who goes for hajj, ghazi, if someone who's striving in, his, in Allah's path, and gives his life, qari, and the one who is someone who is recites the Quran. All of these people, be, because of the lack of pure sincerity, and they will be told that whatever you did was because they're trying to accommodate people, not for me. Unfortunately, this huge sin will drag these people towards hellfire. How is it shirk? It's shirk because you're trying to please someone besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if a person is praying salah and he extends that salah because the mom walked in, dad walked in, some friends walked in, that's shirk al-khafi. It's not there to please Allah. We elongate it because we want to impress someone else. So whenever we do any action in which we are not sincere, we are doing it to show off people, get their approval then that's, a lot, that's an issue. Then our sincerity is lacking there. If someone feels like these sins have been committed in the past, how do you rectify them now? We just simply seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We simply will, uh, will have to seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, Allah, whatever has happened in the past, please forgive me. And that's it. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most merciful, most kind. There's no stuff to go back to do anything about it. If a person is being forced to do some religious action, like nafil, is that shirk al khafi? So they say everything starts, every ibadah starts with an ada. Sorry, every, this is a nice point. Every ibadah starts off with a riya. Then it becomes ada. Then it becomes ibadah. It starts off first to show. So now when we were little kids, we used to pray, but when our parents are there, when dad is there, we'd make it longer. We'd definitely pray our sunnah before and after and all that stuff. Some relatives are over. Everyone's going to the dasakhan, the food to eat. After maghrib hours, our sunnah is not finishing. Right? All of us probably may remember examples like this. Alhamdulillah, I have three children. May Allah keep them safe. And I watch all of these things <laughs> happening in some of them. And this reminds me of my own childhood. So that's completely fine, completely fine. When you're starting off something, when you're starting off something, even if you're not six years old and you're 16 or 26, it's okay if something starts off with riya. And then eventually, what did I say it'll become? Ibadah. And then after it becomes ibadah, what will it become? I'm sorry, to start off with riya, then it will become a habit. Adah means habit. It will become habit. Third thing will become ibadah. So to sum up, the answer is that if you are not wanting to feel, you're not doing it, but everyone around you is praying nafil, then go ahead and do it. Don't worry about it. You will keep on doing it, and then you force yourself to say, ya Allah, you know me. I'm doing it because my dad is here, my left, my mom's here, and my right. They're all like, chalo beta, come, 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 read. Pray your nafil. So I'm praying it. But ya Allah, I'm, I'm changing my intention now. So inshallah, eventually, from a show, it will become a habit. From habit, it will become ibadah. Okay. Anything else? All right. So um, when it comes to uh, ujub, inshallah, we'll continue on next week. Um, okay. So someone's question about loans and, and, and student loans and interest. Uh, if you've awarded an interest-based loan and it's something that you can pay it back, you can pay it back before starting to incur interest, and that would be permissible. I'm saying this is a relevant question to all of you. And if you cannot, meaning it's like as soon as you take the loan, you have to start paying interest. Then we need to start trying to look for other alternative you know, ways. Um, if you get what I'm saying. Now with the whole COVID crisis, if I'm not mistaken, I heard Trump said, I heard, or someone attributed to him that, uh, they're going to give a break in student loans or at least an interest in student loans. So um, look into that. As long as you don't have to pay the interest up front and as long as you have time after graduation to try to pay back, six months, eight months to start trying to pay back that, then that's fine. Because once you finish the form, uh, graduate school too or whatever school, you can even take a qarda hasana, a loan from someone. Qarda hasana means a loan in which there's no interest pay off that debt, and then slowly pay the brother or sister back eventually. All right, any other questions? Um, if you have some family members who are 
and yourselves, we, we may have our own money and stay saved up. We have to give zakat for that. If your mom and dad have given you ownership of your own money or you're working, many of you are working, you have your own money. Please ensure you, you discharge your zakat. Now you got a lot of zakat questions, how to calculate zakat on jewelry, on cash, loans, debts, accounts receivable, all that stuff. Just because we're not earning six figures does not mean we don't have to give zakat. It's better to be safe than sorry. It's better for us to learn it right now. Please pray for, for myself um, and all of you. I pray for you. This is a blessed day for Juma. Let's make a short dua. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allahumma Ya Allah, grant all of us sincerity. Ya Allah, protect us, our hearts from jealousy. Protect us from insincerity. Protect us from envy. Protect us, Ya Allah, from shirk al khafi. Ya Allah, protect us from ojo, from kibber, from arrogance, from self, from self praise, from conceit. Oh Allah, we ask you grant all of us ikhlas. Oh Allah, we ask you grant all of us ikhlas and sincerity. Oh Allah, whatever was said, it was indeed. Ya Allah, uh, if there's any good, it was indeed from you. If mistakes were made, it's from my own nafs and shaitan. Oh Allah, allow us to practice in whatever is being shared and said, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, oh Allah, please allow this beautiful Jummah is before it ends, before the sun sets. Grant us forgiveness, grant us forgiveness. Allow us to make the most use of the remaining days and nights of Ramadan. Allow us to make use of the remaining days of Jummah. Subhanahu wa rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wa salamu ala al-mursaleen. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Jazakum Allah khaira. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.